Let us pray before we begin. I would like to invite you to please bow your heads for the pastoral prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the chance to worship to you, to worship you in spirit and in truth together with our families, together with our friends, spouse, children, siblings. We thank you, Lord, for the chance of bringing us together once more, even today, so that at least once a week, we can meditate on your word purely for worship. I pray that your word will continue to come alive in each of our experience today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today you will let the Holy Spirit to search each of our hearts and, and convict us of those sins that had been hiding in there for quite some time already and bring us back into our knees and confess all those before you. Father, I confess to you all of my sins that I had committed in thoughts, in words, and even in deeds, and even those that I have forgotten or I may have missed already. I thank you for the Holy Spirit searching my heart and searching our hearts and allowing us to know where we have made a mistake and bringing this mistake to you in order to claim that forgiveness that Jesus Christ has provided for us in the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that we all have. Thank you for the healing that you also have provided for our brothers and sisters who had gone through the hospitals and clinics and even simply from the bedrooms. Thank you for the extra strength that you have provided as they were suffering from pain, discomforts, and anything that causes the illness and discomforts into their bodies. I thank you for the protection that you have provided for the week long that we have been living with you and interacting with our families and other people. Thank you for the protection from COVID that for ever since you had provided for us. Thank you as well for the provision that you, Lord, had sustained us through. Thank you for the surprises of the many blessings that come to our doors in order to, to encourage us and to provide for us. We thank you, Lord God, for the comfort that we have experienced through the messages of your people and through the encouraging messages of our friends, brothers and sisters in the faith. And thank you for the hope that you have provided that even when we become weak, there will always be that strength that comes from you that will only be made perfect through these weaknesses. I thank you, Lord God, for the sorrows and joy that we had experienced, for the sickness and the health that we are enjoying, and even for the needs we always remember you, especially in the abundance that you also had provided. I pray that we will not fall into the trap of forgetting you when abundance is there, when health is there, and when joy is there. But I pray that throughout these positive experiences, we will always look up to you and remember you and worship you. Father, I pray for those friends that are near to us, for those families that live with us. I pray that you will continue to bless them with our presence, as well as bless us with your presence, O Lord. We thank you for those teachers that teach us the word and that teach us our children. I pray that you will continue to give them wisdom so that they can lead their students into you by sharing the gospel and tidbits, wisdom from your words. We thank you for the leaders that run our country. I pray that you too will continue to give them the wisdom as they make decisions right there. Free them from evil thoughts and evil plans. I pray for a wiser discernment to each one of them, from the national leader even to the local government units that we have in here in Cebu. We thank you for guiding them so that they'll know the way in order to continue to exist even in the midst of this pandemic. I pray for the leaders of the economy, continue to give them this uh, wise perspective and vision as well, O oh Lord, to strengthen the economy that has been affected so much. I pray that they will continue to support local businesses and, and ease some difficulties in terms of processing, renewals, and some other stuff that may have hindered the progress and the, and the uh, uh, profit-making of such business establishment. 
I pray, Lord God, for those friends that are far away from us, those that are in other countries. We remember them and we bring them before you. I pray for those family members who are OFW and living already in another country. Continue to be with them just as you are always with us. I thank you, Lord God, for today. And I thank you for the guidance and the instruction of the word. I pray that we would be sparing this moment to simply come sit down together with our families, friends, siblings, spouse, and those that are with us today as we worship you and listen to you through this video. Please continue to teach us, change us through your word. In Jesus' name, I commit all these things to you. Amen. Good day, Cebu Gospel Church. I thank the Lord for, again, there is another chance that I can share with you. And so one thing that comes to my mind when I remember my past is Voltes 5. <laughs> kawai kawai kayo dyan. If you are aging like, like my age, I know you know Voltes 5. He is one of my favorite. And I have lots of memories with Voltes 5. You know, when I was eight years old, perhaps younger, well, 1978, um, TV was one of my childhood big entertainment. Voltis 5 was one of my favorites. So I used to watch TV through the window of our neighbor, you know, standing on a, an empty can of milk and tiptoeing so that I could reach the level of the window where I can see their TV. Oh boy, it was tiring to stand on one can, on one leg, just to see and watch Voltis 5. But who cares? That's Voltis 5, right? And I could feel the power when Voltis 5, you know, give me that power, that volt, that, that energy that comes from watching an episode of him. Unfortunately, the old guy in the house would close the window and send me away. Probably because I was noisy, I was cheering for the fight of Voltis 5, and I was fighting with him against the evil enemies. But you see, I was sent away. He closed the window, sent me away, and he said, you're too noisy, go home. Well, it did not matter to me during that time, even if I was treated that way. As long as there is a little hole on the window, it's okay with me. I will tell you more about that later. But when I get older and see a similar instance, children are watching TV in the neighbor's house, the situation made me ask the question, how do we treat one another in the church built by Jesus Christ? And here are more questions that comes. To what extent will, we, will a father pursue a strayed away child? How do his children live under the roof of this kind of father? How do they live? How do children of God live among their brothers and sisters, young and old, in the kingdom of God? You see, these questions are basically the same in its core. And answering these questions answers the very basic question of all, how do Christians treat each other? Today, we are going to meditate and learn from the parable of Jesus, the lost sheep. And I know you are familiar with this particular passage of scripture, but it is found in Matthew chapter 18. The first four verses of Matthew chapter 18 prepares the stage for the rest of the whole of chapter 18. Jesus told an analogy for his disciples to imagine what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the passage points us um, how we, as his children, should relate to one another in the church. And in here, Jesus reveals the marks of his Christian followers. Number one mark of the Christian followers that Jesus Christ indicated in chapter 18 is that of humility. Um, or they are humble people. It is the characteristic of the little child. That's why he took the little child and say, unless you become like this child or like a child, 
You know, unless you take their humility, you cannot be great in the kingdom of heaven. Humility is a must in every believer of Jesus Christ. It is the humility that comes from simply trusting the Father and not anyone else, not even in his own capacities and strength. And even during the silences of God in his life, he remains humble and simply put himself at the expense of the heavenly Father. The second mark that Jesus Christ listed in chapter 18 is that of protecting one another so that we will not sin. And that is taken from verses five down to nine. That we do not tempt one another to sin. Forbid not that you would not, you know, you would not lead one child of mine to sin or influence a fellow believer to fall into sin. In fact, as Christians, we need to protect one another from sinning. And so here comes the third mark that Jesus Christ wanted his followers to have. It is loving one another. He wanted us to be loving kind of people. And this is the focus of, I, of my meditation that I will be sharing with you today. It is found in verses 10 down to 14. And we will go back to this later on. The fourth mark that Jesus Christ wanted his disciples to develop and see in their life is that of forgiveness. He wanted them to be forgiving to one another. And here lies the question, Lord, how many times should I forgive my, bro my brother? And Jesus said, 70 times seven. And please don't go into the mathematics of that. He simply means be patient. As long as you are alive, there might be some conflict within you, but but the most important benchmark of a true believer in here is that you are ready to forgive one another. This sets up the ideal lifestyle for us in terms of forgiveness and the godly patience that goes with it. And ladies and gentlemen, to forgive one another, perhaps one time, two times, three times, maybe 40 times or perhaps 70 times demands godly patience indeed. So let me share my thoughts on the third uh, mark that Jesus Christ had put in here, loving one another. And how the love of the Father to his children compels us to do the same. And so let's move on. Now, the Father, I have entitled this sermon, The Father Loves His Children and So Do We. Now, I put this in a very positive tone because the passage in scripture that you will read in verse 10 started in a negative saying, do not despise, okay? So this, Jesus teaches his disciples and followers to love one another. He told this parable of the lost sheep to make this particular point. Love them, do not despise God's children. Let us go into the scripture and read it together. And if you can read with me, please do. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. Um, next uh, verse here says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains, that means protected by the mountains, and go in search of the one that went astray? Another verse is saying, the other verse 13 says, and if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. And lastly, verse 14, it says, And so, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, let me repeat that verse 14 because it is a very, very big verse to me. So, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish perish. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, 
Jesus is saying concerning how we treat one another as children of God, whether we are young or old, whether we are adult or still immature, Jesus said, do not despise any child of God. Instead, love them. You know, when I was younger, let me continue now my, my earlier story. When I was younger, I, I used to watch TV from my neighbor. I told you that um, a while ago. Through his window that is closed, I stood on a milk can to reach the window and, and view through a little crack on the window, which is closed by that time. The neighbor was so annoyed to, uh, of me that he quickly opened the window and guess what? Spat into the window. And so, accidentally, the saliva, I'm sorry for those who are eating right now, but the saliva had stuck on my face. And he did not know that it happened to me. But I was there. Unfortunately, he was one of my distant grandfather. As six years old, or rather as eight years old, you know, during that time, as an eight-year-old boy, I just wiped it off from my face and attempted to watch the TV again, only to find out that even that little hole and crack that I used to see through so that I can see the TV was covered with a cotton bud. I felt despised and rejected. And I felt so small that, you know, he can spat on my face. When my mom knew it, she rushed into her uncle's house and did what she had to do to protect me. You know, the idea of being despised is to look down upon, or is to be looked down upon, or to treat other believers with contempt, insult, rejection. But instead, because they are believers of Jesus Christ, they should be treated with love, with love and care. Christians should treat fellow Christians with uh, love and care. Jesus has reasons for it, for, it, for, it, for it. He says that we should love one another. You know, for some reasons, this particular human tendency that we seem to live by, we tend to look down and despise other believers in the church. Perhaps despise other believers that goes to another church. Or perhaps despise other denominations that we do not agree on. Perhaps due to an old quarrel that we have heard about the person, we might tend to despise him. Or maybe due to a sense of competition, I don't know. Perhaps due to, his, to this unexplainable innate human tendency to just look at ourselves more highly than others. Which is the opposite of what the Apostle Paul says. Regardless of reasons, that causes us to despise any of the followers of Jesus Christ, the children of God, or a believer of God, any Christians in this context. Jesus said, we must not despise any of God's children. Perhaps anyone at all, we should not despise anyone at all, even if they are unchurched. There are two compelling reasons why we should not despise other believers, but love them and care for them instead. Reason or compelling reason number one. The Heavenly Father provides angels for His children. Did you notice verse 10 there? You know, verse 10 is, is quite um, obvious, and let me read that particular uh, verse to you, see that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now what does that mean? Now it means that someone reports to the Father 
What is happening to any of his children? Now, there are some confusions that come along this line, and before you make the conclusion, please listen to me. Some people will be tempted to think that this passage means that all children or every believer in the world has been assigned a guardian angel. And so the logic that goes with it and the implication that goes with it is this. If there are 8 billion people in the whole world, there are also 8 billion angels assigned to each one of them. And so that's the confusion so far. And you see, while the Bible says a lot about angels and the ministry, they are involved in purposes of the Father, this passage do not say that there is an assigned guardian angel to guard and protect us. You know, I really like the idea of guardian angel. In fact, when I was younger, I used to pray a, a prayer for the guardian angel. And I like, I like the idea of that. Unfortunately, the more I dig down into the scripture, the more I can see that guardian angels are so designed so that they'll be assigned to every individual. But you see, um, the Catholics are huge treatment. Our friends are, are huge when it comes to the treatment of angels and seems to be the pioneer of this particular guardian angel concept as reflected in this prayer and doctrine. Here is the prayer. I don't know if you can, you can still memorize it, but it says, Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Now, this is a beautiful prayer I know by heart when I was younger and when I was not a believer yet. In fact, I pray this so sincerely until I know that I cannot pray to an angel. Yes, the angels have some jobs to take our prayers, put them into a basket perhaps, and burn incense with it, and so the aroma of our prayer goes up to God. Revelation says that, but the Bible did not say that you should worship or pray to angels. Now, you see, according to this Catechism, from infancy to death, human life is surrounded by their angels, watchful care and intercession. This is the Catholic teaching. This is the teaching that I was brought into when I was growing up. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector. Can you imagine that? Angels as protector and shepherds leading him to life. Already here on earth, the Christian life shares by faith in the blessed company of angels and men united to God. And this is taken from the Catechism of the Catholic Church 336. Now it is a doctrine. And so I think a lot of us are so affected by this particular doctrine. It sounds nice to the ears, but you know what? It leads you towards praying to an angel or worship of an angel, which actually the angel themselves say, no, please don't worship or kneel before us. Because only God has to be worshiped to God alone we should pray. God sends angels to his people. That's a fact in the scripture. And the Bible has so many instances, so many examples of this. For example, an angel help Peter escape from prison. You open your Bibles to Acts chapter 12, you will find that. He rescued Peter from prison. Angels were also used and sent by God to shut the mouth of the lions when Daniel was surrounded by them inside the lion's den. Now, a lot more of other examples could be cited as angels do God's work in many different ways. I think it's likely that God is sending angels to do the similar sort of things in the lives of of his modern people, and that includes you, and that includes me. Listen to this very, very carefully. In order for God to do and express his ministry to you, his work in you, he can send angel if he likes. It happened to the Bible, people, biblical people. It can also happen to the modern believers. Let me share with you my angels in life. I have my own experiences of angels as well. 
2002, for example, the angel appeared as a midnight traffic enforcer. I'm not sure if I had shared you know, this particular story with you. We come from the hospital because my, my wife was spotting due to a premature contraction of her pregnancy. And so I was so tired, I drove back to BTC, running fast through a red light at around one o'clock midnight. And there in the corner of uh, De La Montaña and Mabolo, somewhere there, now there is a flyover there, a traffic enforcer in full uniform stopped me and said, hey, stop. And I said, sir, I'm so sorry. Did you see that it is the red light? Why are you driving so fast? Don't do that or else there will be two of you in the hospital anymore. And I thought, thank you very much for reminding me. Thank you. And then I just realized after I step on the gas again slowly, after a few seconds, I look back, I look back, and the traffic enforcer was gone. And I thought, Lord, did you just send an angel to warn me of a danger ahead if I had not stopped in the red light or I had run that, that fast, sleeping in my mind, but my eyes are quite open? And so I had an angel. I interpreted it as an angel sent by God, midnight, as a traffic enforcer. 2012, my mother-in-law was in the house. She had a life and death situation. And I was at Bethany preaching to Bethany Christian School. My wife was alone in the house. And my mother-in-law had collapsed somehow. And so she called a taxi. It was 8 o'clock in the morning, and the traffic from A.S. Fortuna down to Foodland to the flyover there is so bad. Bumper to bumper, the taxi cannot move. My mother was so pale. It seems like she's breathing very, very faint. My wife was almost to the point of tears, and he cried, Lord, help us. And suddenly, almost like dropped there in front of the taxi was an ambulance. It is, it is a multi-cab ambulance, tayaon na, you know, rotten type. But there is the siren right on the top, and then shouting, wailing siren, wow, 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 wow. And my wife said, Manong, there is an ambulance right in front of us. Follow him. And so the taxi driver just followed follow the ambulance until they reach the esquina of perpetual succor and the ambulance simply disappeared right before their eyes. Talk about angels. Talk about God's protection. God sent angels along the way. Sometimes you would miss them if you are not um, into it or you are not in tune to their presence. But trust the Bible. He sends angels to do his work on us. 2016. My mother, my own mother, was in the hospital in Sanitarium Bacolod City. And she was about to go out. I thank the Lord for it. Finally, she's, she's okay. By the way, my mother is, has already passed away. This is 2016. And I went home to provide for the hospitalization. The hospitalization was beyond my capacity to pay. And I was just walking aimlessly along Laxon Street and passed by an auto supply. When the owner of the auto supply, who the person I don't know, know me by person, he said, Pastor Ricky, shouting from the cash register area to the door of the, or to the front desk of the, rather front part of the store, Pastor Ricky, come in. And so he dragged me down behind the, the, uh, the cash register, took all of the money that, that he had there for the day. It was only about 11 o'clock, and so he just had three hours of opening the store. He took all the bills, crumpled bills on some coins, and said, here is the money for you. Pay the hospital bills. Talking about angels, he sent angels for my own provision. 2019, some of you were there in Singapore um, during the IDMC. For some reason, during the singing of him, I was like, you know, caught in a weird situation that the 7,000 crowd disappeared right before me and around me. And it seems as if I was alone standing. I can see myself. It seems like someone is telling me, that is you. He was carrying bags of, and, and loads right upon his shoulders and on his head. And his knees were already trembling. And so, in this particular vision, I, I, I told Jesus, Jesus, are you not going to help that man? That's me in the picture. 
to help that man, he's, he's struggling. And Jesus said, don't worry, everything will be all right. And boom, gone. And all the 7,000 crowds returned that right there. And I sung together with him with all of my tears flowing from my very eyes. I had just encountered a spiritual encounter during that time. And before I knew it, so many stresses came in. Pandemic strike. And I, I, I had my, my lower back pain and, and so many other things that came. Talking about angels, God ministers to us in very, very angelic way. 2020, pandemic at its maximum impact. Friends from this church delivering food to us at BTC tell about angels providing for us. And they have names. And I know their names. There are just too many to count, though. But hey, thank you for becoming angels, God's messengers to us during those times. 2021, a church deaconess from this church angeled us through the hospital during our surgery moments. When I feel so disoriented, I do not have any assistant at all because the hospital would not allow any helpers, only one patient, one guardian. What do I do? I, I cannot run around at the same time making decisions, but a deaconess from this church had guided us through until we are able to get out of the hospital. Thank you very much for ministering to us and doing God's work in us through you. You have become an angel. God sent us angel in forms of people. And I don't want to forget to say thank you, church. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for standing by us during our very needful moment. When my wife had a surgery, um, it was a quite difficult experience to even just think through. But I thank the Lord because of your presence standing by us, making yourself available for questions, for referrals, for what to do next. The experience had been light for us. And I'd like to express our gratitude for ministering to us in a very, very special way. Thank you for providing the needs that we needed the most. The Lord sent angels to minister to us. If he wants to, you can't stop it. Angels would come. Yet even with these very personal experiences, the Bible does not teach of a guardian angel assigned to every believer. Instead, the Bible speaks of angels in a more general terms. Hebrews 1.14, where they are referred to as ministering spirits. They are ministers of God, sent out to serve God's people. You see, if you are a God's child, angels serve you. Don't forget that. They are serving God's people. So however the Lord wants to minister to his people, he can send an angel if he wants to. You may ask, why is the teaching of angel is important? Why am I discussing this now? Well, number one, the scripture said so. Don't you know that angels in heaven always see the face of the Father in heaven? Why is it important? This is the importance of this particular teaching in, of angels. If the Father in heaven send his angels to serve and protect his children, then how much more must we love God's children? So why are we loving God's children? Why are we loving Christians? Because the Father even loved them so much so that he sends angels to minister to them. If God commands angels to attend to the needs of his children, then how can we treat our fellow Christians with indifference? If God commands angels to attend and minister to his children, then how can we despise the little children of God? Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, God send his angels to minister to those whom he love. And how does that affect us? Actually, you and I may become an angel to them too, in the sense that you can minister to them, protect them from sinning, and lead them back to God. 
minister to them in a very special way. But never ever despise any child of God. Compelling reason number two. The Heavenly Father individually pursues His children. So why, do we should, why should we not despise the children of God or any one of His children? Why should we love the children of God? Because the Heavenly Father individually pursues His children. Notice verses 12 to 14. This is now the parable of the lost sheep that Jesus told in this particular portion of the text. It reinforces a similar point. We must not despise the children of God in the light of the Father's personal and individual pursuit of His children. The parable that Jesus shared tells us that when even one out of the hundred sheep goes astray, this shepherd pursues that one. And Jesus says that the father is not willing that one of these little ones perish in verse 14. You see, this online platform um, of classes is very, very different and challenging, not only to us as teachers, but more to the students that we teach. A few of BTC students have a difficult time because of this particular format of teaching. For some reasons, their families are not supportive. They are probably um, unconsciously unsupportive of the online classes that's going on in the life of their children. Their churches also are also unconsciously unsupportive of their online classes that's going on and they put the students into high gear of Christian ministry, and they simply forget that they needed to do their classworks also. And so, a lot of our students had failed. I mean, not a lot, but some of the students, or maybe not some, few of the students had failed their classes. We lose some of them. Some got sick. Some had suffered from depressions. And some do not know what to do anymore. But I admired the seeking of BTC's dean of student life to all of her students. What she did was, you know, she calls them one by one and asks what's happening with them. And at one point, she recalled that one student shared with her in ironic tears. The student said, teacher, I have been recognized in our church as a faithful minister because I serve without question. During this pandemic, everyone was happy for me. My, my parents and family were happy for me, but no one in my church knew how I was so far away from completing all of my school works. That's why the student had failed almost 100% of all the subjects that he enrolled. But ironically, he was in high gear of ministry and appreciated by the church, recognized as one hard-working pastor, young pastor student, a student pastor. The student, unfortunately, may be unable to pass any of the subjects he enrolled this semester. But to be fair, this student was one of those shining students when the classes were still face to face. Brain smartness is not a problem to the student, but somehow there is something wrong when they're lost from our reach. But then I like the idea that when I reflect on this, isn't it that this is how it looks like when the Heavenly Father individually pursues His child, He calls them, He reaches out to Him, He talks to Him, He encourages Him, and He provides for what's next so that life will be changed. Child of God, let this truth sink in. Now if you are the son or a child of a Heavenly Father, take a minute and let this truth soak you into it. You can actually pause this video and think how God pursued you when you were gone astray. 
Talk about it with the one viewing this message with you. The Father cares for you, and He is committed to pursuing you as His child. John's gospel reminds us of this truth. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I know my own sheep, and they know me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. You know what? These are hard, rock, solid, forever established promises of God for you and for me, for all of His children. And if this is how the Father loves His children, then... This is how we must love one another in the faith and in the church. We must pursue one another, particularly the one among us that wanders away, because this is what God does. The father never loses a single child of his. There is nothing we could do to keep God from pursuing us. He pursues us, whether you like it or not. There is no sin too great, no distance we could run that would discourage God from pursuing us. From the moment you were born, God has been pursuing you already in your heart. His greatest longing is for a relationship with us. And it cost Him His Son in this pursuit of you. And it's the very Son of God that tells us how they did all this. So don't let a wrong understanding of who God is cause your relationship with Him to be based on performance or works. Don't let your sin and your failures get in the way of running to the open arms of the Heavenly Father because Jesus had provided a way to the Father, breaking the deceits and the barriers of personal performance and penitential works, as well as the condemnation of our failures and sin. Jesus broke them all, thus providing a way, a direct access from you or from where you are to the Heavenly Father. Brethren, God is after your heart right now. He is sweetly knocking on the door of your heart that you might simply let him in. More than he wants you to do something for him today, he simply wants you to know that he is with you and he is for you. And I'd like to encourage you to respond to God's pursuit today by giving him your heart, giving him your all. May your time of prayers be guided by this revelation from the scripture of his loving kindness towards you by sending angels to minister to you or if he needed to, pursue you individually. Take heart. Because of the rock solid fact that we read in verse 14, the father never loses a single one of his children. He will never lose you. And so, according to verse 14, it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of my little children should perish. Take hope, my friend, my brother, my sister. Trust his pursuit of you. He is in this pursuit right now. Be still. He's coming to find you. And He will find you. So to what extent will a father pursue his straightaway child to the extent of securing and leaving the 99 and go to look for the one that had strayed away. You know, God pursues his children 
whether by one, sending angels to protect them, provide for them, minister to them, and two, to personally go and pursue him individually and personally. So how then do we respond to such loving commitment of God to us as his children? We respond by not despising fellow believers. Instead, because the Father loves his children, and so we do as well. May the Lord bless us as we listen to his word. I'd like to invite you for the prayer of benediction today. Please bow your heads for the benediction. Let's pray. Thank you for the love that you have given to us, O Heavenly Father. Help us in return to love your children as well. Provide us with such kind of agape love so that we will be able to avoid despising any one of them and that our hearts will be able to accommodate of them, all of them, even those that are not pleasant to us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.